and welcome to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? My name is Naomi Schaefer Riley, and I am a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And my name is Ian Rowe, and I'm a visiting fellow at AEI. You can listen to Are You Kidding Me? wherever you get your podcasts. Today, we are broadcasting from, of course, our various homes, engaging in social distancing, of course. We have a very special guest with us today, Bob Woodson. Bob Woodson who has had an incredible career, ultimately, I think, all tied together with the idea of how do you make opportunities better for children through a host of various activities. And we're really honored to have Bob here to talk about two particular areas, especially in this time of coronavirus. Something that we're thinking a lot about are just kids and how kids are dealing with this. Imagine if you're a child in a stable parent household and imagine if you're a child in foster care. And so we'd really like to hear your thoughts because many people don't know that you, your career started off in the foster care area. And so it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on what existed when you, you know, started off your career, how that compares to what exists today. And I know Naomi has recently written an article for the City Journal about how kids in foster care are being affected by the coronavirus. Yeah, I really got drawn into this field working with children. I was on my way to the space program. I was in the Air Force and I was in missile test control and I was on my way to get an undergraduate degree and I worked eight hours a night at the juvenile jail while I was getting my degree in math and science. And I was locked on three doors with 65 juveniles in there from gang murder to truancy with no programs. And so, but they were very much like the kids I grew up with and I just sort of lost my heart. There were six of them I would have adopted if I had the means to do so. Because I know that they were a victim of their circumstances. There were no character flaws. And so that sort of redirected my life because I knew that love was not enough, that you need to express love in a disciplined way. And so I then said, instead of getting a master's in math, I got it in social work. My first job was in Delaware County foster care system. And the first thing I did as a caseworker is I visited every one of my caseload and I saw right away the injury that was being done by the helping hand of the foster care system. We had a little girl, Kathy, who was taken into care when she was six months old. She hasn't had a visit in seven years. Mm -hmm. Left on a farm with an elderly woman and another child. And the woman said, but Kathy couldn't hear or speak. And so I asked her, how long has she been like this? She said she had a fever when she was nine months old and she called the agency and no one responded. So she had rheumatic fever. I took her and put her with the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf and put her in a foster home where that was nurturing. Right. And then I saw incidents after incidents where children were taken away because the social worker felt the home was too dirty. Or the mother would leave the 14-year-old to babysit the other children while she went shopping. And the social worker would show up and find her guilty of neglect. And so what happened, they would take the children and put them in foster care. The mom said, just give me enough money to hire a babysitter for a few minutes, and then you won't have to take my children. What year was that, Bob, that you started? 69 and 70. Yeah. This was before the real scourge of drugs and also a lot of the family breakdown that I think you you see much more in, in the system now. I mean, that... It's not just money that is preventing a lot of families these days from taking care of their kids. No, it it really isn't, and it wasn't then. But even when mothers voluntarily uh, came in to say, listen, I've got to go to the hospital. Can you just take my children on a temporary basis? And two weeks they show up, and the agency says, no, now you you got to qualify to get your children back. Yeah. So they want to know, well, where are you living? Where are you working? And so it took a year and a half to reunite the mom. She loved them. All she needed was temporary help. The other reality is there was a study, only 3% of those children who came into care had any psychological dysfunction. The problem was their parents either went to jail or neglect or what. But once the kids come into care and they're moved three and four times within the first four years and they begin to decline, the more they move, the more they decline the more valuable they are to the agency because the state reimburses them them on a higher level at each time the child declines and goes further into foster care, therapeutic home, therapeutic group home, 
Each time the child descends, the more the state reimburses the local organization. And wow. so I found that to be really perverse. I know you're starting to think about, especially this, the role of private agencies and private religious agencies in particular, not only in, in foster care, but also you know, helping young people who are trying to transition, who are trying to you know, get their foothold in the world. We've definitely heard stories in the last few weeks of kids who were in foster care and maybe they they actually were one of the lucky few who went to college and the college closed their campus and now they have nowhere to go or young people who have simply aged out of the system and, you know, they don't have a family that they can shelter in place with. What do you see as the potential, you know, here for the the private sector to step up and, and what kinds of support should we be offering these young people? Well, historically, you know, foster care and adoption was run ex- exclusively by the church and private agency. It was only during the 30s when the economy tanked that the government step in. But what the government did was pay only for children who were out of homes and not to return. And so I just think that that private agency harvest of hope that you know about Pastor Soros yeah. in New Jersey took in 60 infants who were in care in the hospitals and placed them among his congregation. And every one of those 60 children were raised for 20 years by this congregation. When if those children were gone into the system, they would be in prison or they would be homeless. Yeah. And so we saw examples from the, both the past and the present. When you mobilize private institutions within these communities, a safe family for children, who come alongside families in crisis, like a mom has to go in for surgery, a church member would take the children in, and then when the lady comes out, they reunite it. So they work closely with the neighborhoods and the natural parents. But we give short shift to this as a resource. Yeah, I actually got an email from someone at Safe Families today talking about some of the work that they're doing in this time they're even trying to provide child care for, for medical workers who are supposed to be separated from their children as a result of the virus. You know, it's amazing the, the kind of things that, you know, they can come up with, the ways that they know that they can help that, you know, if you sat around waiting for the mayor, the governor, or the president, or some bureaucrat to, you know, you, you'd be waiting much longer. In Illinois, for instance, there are 5,000 children who have been prevented from going into the foster care system because Safe Families for Children provided that intermittent. New York City prohibits churches from taking kids in. New York City, by law, prohibits any of those private organizations from stepping in and providing temporary shelter to the children of those workers. So, Bob, you just described a situation where there's this perverse incentive to provide more money for each level where a child is descending or declining. What are the right incentives? How should we think about getting states to actually help kids versus... You you get more of what you reward and less of what you punish. The simple market principle. If you want more children to remain in their homes, if you want children to to find refuge within their communities or local church, then provide the economic incentives for them to do that. And I think the, the First Care Act is coming out that really is organized to defund some of these group foster homes. That's a step in the right direction. But we also should call upon the private sector. I think there's enough private dollars to really, if we were to to give proper attention to, right now, we have all kinds of TV specials about how companies are stepping up in this crisis and providing masks masks, and not. But why don't we focus the same attention on some of those organizations that are taking a mom who's working the third shift and the church has taken her kids in so she don't have to choose between her children or her job. We ought to highlight these courageous acts that are going on every day in our community. I'm a little bit concerned, and I've told Ian in the past, I'm a little bit concerned. I understand what you're saying about the financial incentives, but a little bit concerned about the rush to close down some of these group homes. A lot of the kids who are in them actually don't have another place to go. And some of the reporting recently has suggested that when we close down group homes, that what happens is the kids end up in either you know medical institutions or they end up in juvenile detention facilities. And so sometimes when you start closing off options, then you put kids in the wrong place. 
First of all, group homes in Atlanta and other cities have been places where pimps pull up on Friday night and Saturday night and girls climb out of windows and 13 right. and 14 year olds and they're taken to strip clubs where they're prostituted. That's, that's my experience with group homes. But I agree with you, it shouldn't just be a radical stopping it. We should do so to transition. Pastor Soros and other pastors around the country have the means and the will and the desire to work with each of those states and provide an alternative to those group homes. We need to bring alongside the closing of group homes a private sector resource so that the kids can transition out of the group into something. So I agree with you, but we must have an alternative prepared that corresponds with the closing down. It's closing down and opening up. Should right, work we need to get circle. serious about recruitment of you know foster and adoptive families. And right now, I don't think that you read stories about the shortage of them. I don't think most states have a very good plan in place for how to change that. The question is, who makes those placement decisions? I remember when in Chicago, they had a campaign to recruit Black parents. 200 applied. Only three made it through the maze of restrictions that yeah. they put on. A very close friend of mine and his wife, who both have master's degrees, upper middle class parents, they were traumatized by going through the adoption process. Yeah. Traumatized by how shabbily they were treated. And I really believe the way that because there's a perverse incentive for maintaining the system the way it is. Because the more the kids decline, the larger the reimbursement from the state. As long as that perverse incentive costs the kids have become a commodity. In a lot of states, you know, they have actually, some of the faith-based institutions have started taking over the recruitment and training process because the state was doing such a bad job of it. And I think a lot of states recognized that it was a terrible process for parents to go through. And so, you know, in, in Arkansas, you have the group The Call, which has, you know, done a lot of work in this a Project 127, which we've talked about on this program in Colorado. And, you know, they actually have the people come to their church or other, other churches in order to do that training and recruitment. And they're actually helping people get through the red tape that the state has put up in order to improve the recruitment of foster families. Yeah, but the question is, then who makes the ultimate decision? Okay, so the churches recruit, they train, but then they have to take these people to the bureaucracy. That bureaucracy makes that decision. I think we've got to think about ways of transferring that placement decision also. To the private to, sector? To, to whom? To yes, whom? the way it used to operate. Absolutely. I know that's a radical <laughs> approach, but I just think we have to look, on, look at under what circumstances can we transfer the authority to make placement decisions to the private sector. And would those private sector institutions still be funded by government or they're independently Not necessarily. It does, it, they, don't, they don't have to be funded by uh, the government. I think we need to go back in the past. Private institutions were exclusively had the authority to make those kind of decisions. And it only changed with the financial crisis and the private institutions were overwhelmed. And so government intervened and they began to sign, they would contract with the government. But the contracting with the government only covered children in care. So we actually undermined the, the, the authority of private institutions by only reimbursing for children in foster care. So Catholic Charities, Christian Children Bureau, all of them became agents of the government. But the problem is when with the kids in care, I mean, the government is directly responsible for those kids. They're technically in the government's custody. So how are you going to, you know, sort of say, well, we're just going to let Catholic charities make these decisions? Well, first of all, just because something is a government responsibility doesn't mean it has to be governmentally executed. In other areas, government transfers, transfers authority over to private entities to make the I think the government ultimately has the responsibility, yes, to, to terminate a, a parental right. I think that is a government function. Right. But I'm saying short of that, we should try to transfer a much authority for making adoption decisions and others to the private sector as we, as we can. Let's pivot for a moment to another crisis, but of a different kind. 
that affects children. And this is related to the, a project that the New York Times launched last year called the 1619 Project, which is essentially looking to reframe American history by saying that America's true founding was when slaves first came to this country in the year 1619, and that America was not, in fact, founded as a democracy, but it's a slaveocracy, and that white supremacy is literally in the DNA of the country. And I know that you, in full disclosure, I'm part of this effort too, have launched a fantastic project called 1776 that talks about the founding values and virtues of this country still in pursuit of a more perfect union, but always improving. And one aspect of the 1619 project is that there's now a curriculum that's being distributed in places like Newark and Buffalo and Chicago. And this curriculum is teaching kids, as we understand it, that America is a racist, permanently racist country. Talk about potentially doing harm to kids. What's your reaction to this? I think this is one of the scariest things that I've ever seen. But I also think it's an extension of a policy that started back in the 60s. Prior to the 60s, poverty was never associated with dysfunction. Just because you were poor didn't mean you were a bank robber or that you were steal or you were immoral. But what happened, I don't want to take the time to go back, but what we did in the 60s is separate work from income in an attempt to force America to redistribute income. But that's another discussion. But, but today, the worst thing in the world you can do to say to urban young people who are living in these toxic neighborhoods where 70% of the families are single parent, where there's drugs and violence, Black communities suffer a 9-11 every six months. There are more Blacks killing other Blacks in one year than killed or lynched by the Klan in 50 years. But to say to a population of people engaged in that kind of self-destruction that you are exempt from any personal responsibility for your fate is lethal. There's nothing more destructive than communicating to a people that you do not have the agency to be agents of your own uplift. That somehow, if you're robbing and killing one another, it's not your fault. If you're dropping out of school, it's not your fault. That all the responsibility, and there's national security concerns. Because you, you start a child off at 10 years old, and for eight years you tell that child that they're living in a country that hates them, and that the deck is stacked against them. And then they get 18, you say, I want you to go to join the military to defend us. They won't. Or I want you to be a first responder. This is a setup for failure, not only for those communities, but for the country. Why do you think these schools and these districts have been so anxious to adopt this curriculum? First of all, I believe that it's cynical. Because as long as, the, after all, they can avoid asking this question. If racism were the cause of the problem. Why have black kids failed in the last 50 years in systems run by their own people? Governments, social service systems, education are run primarily by blacks in these urban centers, professional blacks. But as long as, to avoid answering that question, if they can convince the people suffering the problem that they, the professional superintendent system, are exempt from any personal responsibility, that somehow the responsibility is with white people. Well, it's just, they, and they say it's systemic. So, <laughs> well, that's the same thing by right, saying exactly. systemic. In other words, white that folks have ends. some remote control device that they point in the black community that causes us to <laughs> miseducate our children. <laughs> that's that's what institutional racism is. We can just get a hold of that 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 that, that little device y'all have, that button, yeah, that button, then we can change this. To me, that's the scariest thing in the world that our young people, and, and, and they're being duped because we, and what we're pointing out in 1776 is that when white people were at their worst, black people were at their best. In the 1930s to 1940, we closed the education gap in the South from three years to six months because we built 5,000 Rosenwald schools. And so there are other examples that really challenge the the truthfulness of what 1619 is saying. If the problems we have today were caused by the legacy of slavery and discrimination, then when racism was enshrined in law, wouldn't you expect us to have been worse off? 
but our marriage rate in 10 years of the depression were higher than in the white community. So is there going to be a 1776 curriculum that can, oh, yes. that can be a counterbalance to this? Yeah, we're going to bring truth to the, to, the, to the table. We're going to try to make common sense commonplace again by <laughs> pointing to examples from the past of how Black Americans, when they were discriminated against, that even 20 Blacks became millionaires, born slaves, but who died millionaires. City of Chicago, for instance, where you see all this destruction, people's all day was redlining. 731 black owned businesses existed in Chicago, 100 million in real estate assets in 1929, wow. and only 15% out of wedlock birth, and that was considered a scandal. I can take you city after city and show you how blacks achieved in the face of discrimination and racism. If we did it then, the question is, why can't we do it now? That's what 1776 is going to pose that question and then answer the question. Well, we are looking forward to when that hits the school. Thank you, Bob. And the reaction. So thank you very much, Bob Woodson, for being our guest today. I am Naomi Schaefer Riley. And I'm Ian Rowe. Thank you, Bob. This has been another episode of Are You Kidding Me? You can get episodes on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month on the AEI website or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again.